Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the New Orleans Jazz Museum. My name is Matt Hampsey. I'm a park ranger with the New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park, which is part of the National Park Service. And we partnered together with the New Orleans Jazz Museum to help create this space many years ago. And it's been a wonderful partnership. We are honored to continue um, nowadays, largely through our Tuesday and Thursday programs. And every month for the last decade or so, we've been doing this special series called Talking Jazz with Fred Caston, and I'm a regular lister of WWNO, uh, Saturday Night Jazz, and uh, the different programs he's done over the years. And um, he's got a great, as they say, voice for uh, radio, but also a wonderful way of connecting um, with musicians and talking about the music and the stories and all the things we like to expound upon. We have a great guest today, Matt Prime and the Matt Bryan Trio, and I will just turn it over to Fred and let him introduce the band. Please join me in welcoming Fred Kasson. Thank you, Matt. That's appreciated, and uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us here this afternoon. Great to have you here for this talking Jazz in concert uh, with a terrific group, and I want to introduce the band to you now. They're going to play a bit before we start talking to Matt uh, about his life in music and time, especially here in New Orleans. So over here on the drums and cymbals is someone that uh, Matt Perrine has known all his life, and he's known Matt all of his life, Mr. Ben Perrine at the drums. Yeah. Our guitarist and vocalist today uh, is someone who splits time between uh, New Orleans and uh, Ohio, is it? Yeah, Akron. <laughs> And uh, we're delighted to have him here this afternoon singing and play for us, Mr. Dave Hammer at the guitar and vocals, ladies and gentlemen. And our, our special guest today is an artist whose work I have enjoyed over 30 years here in New Orleans. Uh, he's a consummate composer and arranger, a, an instrumentalist of prodigious abilities on the sousaphone, a, a, the uh, bass guitar and the stand-up bass. Um, and he always, most impressively to me, marshals those great talents uh, to the benefit of and for the music. And uh, it's a pleasure to have with us at the sousaphone today, Mr. Matt Perrine, the Matt Perrine Trio. Take it away, guys. Well, thank you, Fred. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Thank you for being here. It is such a joy to be here and an honor to be recognized. Uh, to be able to come here and talk to you a little bit about my life as a New Orleans musician and to play some music for you. Uh, we're going to start, I think, with a little bit of jazz, if that's okay, um, which is mainly what I do is play jazz. So uh, this is a sousaphone, for those of you who don't know. Uh, the sousaphone is part of the tuba family, so this is also called a tuba. The difference is usually tubas are instruments that sit on your lap. They sit on your lap, kind of like this. And uh, versus the sousaphone, which was invented by John Philip Sousa for marching. So it sits on your shoulders so you can walk around. So anyway, also he wanted an instrument where the, he wanted to hear the bass come. The original sousaphones, the bells went straight up. And he wanted an instrument that sounded, the sound would come from the kind of atmosphere. Uh, so that was the reason for the sousaphone. So anyway, th that's the most asked question. Half of you can get up and leave now, I suppose. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to start with um, we're going to start with a song um, by Fats Waller called "The Jitterbug Waltz." Oh, 
Spats Waller's Jitterbug Waltz. That's Mr. Ben Perrine at the drums and cymbals. Dave Hammer, our guitar man. And uh, doing the magical sousaphone work, Mr. Matt Perrine, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Oh, thank you. How does he do it? Why does he do it? <laughs> when will he stop doing it? <laughs> Not till it's 3.30. Right? <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, we hope. Uh, Matt, uh, let's talk a little bit about your early days. You, you're a California lad, right? I am. I grew up in California, yes, where the sousaphone is hunted for sport, actually. It's, <laughs> it's How many are they allowed to capture per year? Yeah, well, unfortunately, there's no limit. No limit? Unlimited? No, it's cruel. No limit on sousaphone No, uh, no, hunting. I had to. No season it's, either, it's, right? It's Just a trail of tears leading from <laughs> California to here with sousaphone players all along the way. Um, I'm only partially kidding. Um, you could play the tuba in California if you're polite about it, you know, especially like in the 80s when I was doing it. You know, uh, New Orleans brass band music hadn't taken over the whole planet yet. Yeah. You know, it was about mid-launch by the time I came along, you know. Um, in 1988, I uh, had graduated from high school and I was uh, back in Sacramento, making a living, and as a musician, and um, my sister sent me a cassette tape that had the Dirty Dozen on it on both sides, and I heard the great Kirk Joseph, and at that time I was 19, and uh, it wasn't that I didn't know that a sousaphone could be played that way. I didn't know that the sousaphone was allowed to be played that way, <laughs> and um, uh. and I was arranging at that time. Uh, for a local band, a uh, local uh, kind of a show, Dixieland traditional jazz band. Mm -hmm. um, and my writing immediately started reflecting what I was hearing in the Dirty Dozen. Um, and my playing changed right away and people started looking at me more and more strangely. And, um, um, and then I got an offer to move here in 1991. Steve Yoakum mm. called me. He, he had a job at the Maison Bourbon that was five days a week uh, five hours a day. I'm sorry, six days a week, five hours a day, from 2.30 to 7.30 in the middle of the day. Uh, and he couldn't find any local tuba players who wanted to take that job all the time. And so he was left every week. He'd have different tuba players floating in and out. He just wanted one person who could do the whole gig. And he knew me from um, that work I had done with that other band I was talking about, the Stan Mark Band in Sacramento. And so he offered me a job, and so I packed up and moved here in 91. I was 22 when I moved here. You had started on trombone, right, uh, as, a, as a youngster, and maybe even in elementary school? I did. I started on trombone. I, uh, I thought it looked like it would be the most fun, you know, as a young person. Um, and then I found the tuba a couple of years later and started playing uh, early jazz as a young person playing the tuba. And that combination got me rooted. That's where I really found my first home musically. 
There, the there's a, a, a fairly solid trad jazz scene in California, particularly around Sacramento, right? Yeah, one might call it perversely strange, <laughs> large, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's um, Sacramento in the 70s started a festival. Um, uh, and it was just intended to be a little, little local festival. Uh, there were a bunch of musicians who were mainly up in the Chico area, and they were kind of early jazz enthusiasts, and they had a college band. And many of those musicians had moved from there down to Sacramento, and they, they, they hook up with cats like um, um, uh, Bob Ringwald, who lived there. That's, that's Molly Ringwald's dad. He's a traditional jazz piano player and something of an expert. And so they formed this little fledgling little scene around playing at the Shakey's Pizza Parlor in Sacramento. Um, and then that became a little traditional jazz society, and that little traditional jazz society forms a little. Anyway, 15 years later, this festival is like you, the Jazz Fest here, it has like maybe seven stages going at one time in an area. Honest to God, folks, the traditional, the, the Dixieland Jubilee in Sacramento had four locations with seven or eight stages going all the time from Friday to Monday in downtown Sacramento. It's the craziest thing you ever saw. And they would fly bands in from all around the world, so I got to see in the early 80s, in 1980, my favorite bands were Banu Gibson mm. and uh, the Jazz Band Ball Orchestra from Poland. Um, you know, uh, they always had these all-star bands they put together. They had an East Coast all-star band, which had Howard Alden and all these great players oh, right. and a West Coast all-star band. So anyway, uh, for me, it was an unbelievable opportunity to learn about this music, and that's kind of how that, once again, how that hook got sunk for me, was around this festival. So the festival's the reason why we were all playing early jazz around that time. You also played some, some rock and roll uh, with uh, some of your peers. Uh, you started playing electric bass fairly early. Well, I started playing electric bass because I wanted to play in the school jazz bands, and those school jazz bands didn't want jazz tuba players. They wanted jazz bass, bass players. Bass players. Yeah, so I started on electric bass, and then I played acoustic on, uh, as a freshman in high school. And it was all... Uh, by that point, by the time I was going to high school, I was pretty sure I was going to be, be a professional musician, even though I'd never met one. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, Have you met one yet? And... Uh, <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> yeah. Depends on when you ask. Yeah. I'll, I'll check with you later. <laughs> but I like, you know, I figured that I better play the tuba, the electric bass, and the acoustic bass. I better be able to just play any gig that comes through, and that's just it. Right. You know, I just set my standards to be, I just figured if I could just play all the instruments, then I could get all the gigs or get some of the gigs. Yeah. So that was my thinking as a freshman. I was already on that path, you know. Mm -hmm. You got here uh, to work on Bourbon Street six days a week, five hours, at, 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 at five sets, I guess. Uh, yeah. Uh, how did you like it? Oh, it was horrendous and wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it was everything I'd hoped it would be. And then I, I was, I, I'd been doing that job for a couple of weeks, and uh, I'd been bringing my acoustic bass out at night, sitting in around different places. And I sat in with the night band, who was Wallace Davenport, at the uh, time, yeah. he's a trumpet player, folks who played with, uh, he played with uh, Count Basie's band. He played with Ray Charles's band. He was a band leader from Lyle Hampton for a while. Mm. Super, super heavy cat, and he wasn't particularly happy with this bass player, and so he hired me. So I started playing in the night band, uh, four nights a week, five hours a night. So that was sixty hours a week. Wow! I was at this one place. You were in graduate school there, brother. Boy, you said it. <laughs> Met a lot of musicians. You know, Laura had a lot. I had all these great experiences. I really, this is great. But can I tell you a quick story about working with yeah, her? Yeah, please. Uh, there's this great old bass player named Lloyd Lambert. Lloyd oh, Lambert yeah. played uh, was one of the first electric bass players in New Orleans, if not the first. Um, there's some conversation about that going on right now. Like who was actually the first cat? Probably La Lloyd. Anyway, uh, always dressed to the nines and had been everywhere and played with everybody and just. Uh, he would come in every now and then to sit in or to, to check out Wallace when we were playing at the Maison Bourbon. And whenever he'd walk in, everybody would be like, oh, hey, Lloyd's here. Lloyd's here, bass player. Oh, man, the cat. And uh, I'd never heard him play, really. And so whenever I heard Lloyd was there, man, I'd play every note I knew, <laughs> plus some. Man, I'm, I'm <laughs> figuring I'm, I'm all over this neck. I'm working up a sweat. And Lloyd would smile and whatever. So one of the times, finally... 
uh, Wallace invites Lloyd to sit in, and Wallace, Lloyd decides to do it, so he comes up and he plays. And they're playing when the Saints go marching in, and Lloyd, for his solo, just plays the melody to uh, Red River Valley. Just stands and plays that, and the crowd goes, <laughs> and he just starts to laugh. He looks over at me, he's just, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Siebert told me, a wonderful, wonderful uh, keyboardist and uh, composer, that uh, he got a gig with, in Lloyd's band. Uh, it was one of his first gigs in, in New Orleans. And he said he'd been playing about a month, and he said he, he got the best advice he ever got. He said Lloyd came to him one, one day after, after the gig. He said, Larry, you, you really sound good. And you know, man, you're really going to sound good once you learn your first tune. What he meant by that was understand where the music comes from and what's appropriate for a moment like maybe it's Red River Valley mm-hmm. over the changes to the Saints. Lloyd just, he figured it all out. You know, by the time he got to me, he had it all figured out. He'd drive around town in his Cadillac real slow. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, this, and I mean, we could spend the rest of this interview talking about Lloyd Lambert. I mean, he was such a character, you know. Yeah. Well, um, we'll talk some more about uh, your next moves in New Orleans, but next, let's have some music for now. Oh, my goodness. All right, well, okay. I definitely would like to play for you. As, you've, as you heard just then in that song we played earlier, that sometimes I can, um, I can act like a lead instrument, and sometimes I can also act like a bass instrument. And that's part of what I like about this job, um, that I can do both things. Um, that is, when I'm my job, I can do that. I can't do that so much. I can't be the lead so much on other people's jobs as often because it requires a little more imagination than some people have. Anyway, uh, but I do love backing people up, and I have with us this wonderful musician, Dave Hammer. Doesn't he sound amazing? Yeah. Yes? Yes? Thank you. Dave, would you sing one of those songs for us, one of those things we talked about today? Yeah, sure. Like when you're driving or whatever? Are you asking on the record? Yeah. shining bright I love you in the springtime and I love you in the fall last night on the back porch I love you most of all Thank you. 
love you late at night I love you in the evening When the stars are shining bright Love you in the springtime And I love you in the fall Last night on the back porch I love you most of all Mr. Dave Hammer. Thank you, folks. On the vocals and guitar. Matt Perrion receives the phone, Ben Perrion at the drums and cymbals. Give us one more, lads, before we go back to talk. You know, we're, we're, we're soon, I'm sure, going to be talking about Nine Lives, which is a musical that I'm the musical director of and um, did the arranging of and orchestrating of. We're doing it. Uh, the, the middle Monday between two Jazz Fest weekends. Uh, and it stars Michael Cerberus, who's a big Broadway star. And uh, here's a song that I learned from him. I wouldn't, he brought a few of us to New York when he played his cabaret show at, uh, at, at Lincoln Center at the, um, at the Jazz, the Dizzy's space. Yeah. And uh, he's from Virginia, and he made his way to, spiritually made his way really to New Orleans. He lives in New York, he has a house here in New Orleans. Anyway. He did this song on that show, and uh, I just love it. It's a Jimmy Rogers song called Miss the Mississippi and You. And you. Mississippi and you Days are dark and dreary Everywhere I roam I miss the Mississippi and you Roaming this Under heaven's dome I miss the Mississippi
Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jimmy Rogers, Miss the Mississippi, and you, Mr. Dave Hammer on the guitar and vocal. Thank you, folks. Ben Perrine at the drums and cymbals. Our man on Susie Pound, Matt Perrine. Jimmy Rogers and Louis Armstrong actually recorded together. It's not, not that widely known. The Blue Yodel Number no. 9. Man, I listen to that music, and it all sounds the same to me. <laughs> I mean, I, I understand people make divisions about it and talk about one starts one thing and one starts something else, and somehow that's supposed to mean that they went different places, but they weren't the same damn thing at the beginning. I think it was. You know what I mean? I mean, obviously, culturally, there's some div division, but those guys were after the same stuff. Yeah. And they delivered. I'll say. Um, so you, you, you um, alluded to um, or mentioned uh, Nine Lives. And I do want to talk about that in a little while, uh, Matt. But first, I want to talk about um, some of the bands you uh, became part of not too long after you got here, uh, mid 90s, I think, the Nightcrawlers. That's were right. Formed. Yes. The New Orleans Nightcrawlers, great Holy brass cow. band. Holy cow, who knew? Yeah, just talk about how, how that all came together. Okay, well, <clears throat> we were all in our early 20s, and uh, we were making a living playing around New Orleans, but that's all out of put on a suit and play Hello, Dolly. And I love Hello, Dolly, but not when you're playing in a trio in a suit, playing electric bass behind a bunch of people. You know what I'm saying? We were doing a lot of that kind of work. And um, just kind of not knowing what was next in our lives. And... Uh, and a few of us were composers and arrangers, and uh, we were all friends with this piano player, Tom McDermott, from the Dukes of Dixieland at that time. And he had done some arrangements for uh, the Dirty Dozen to use that he hoped that they would use when they were making their Jelly Roll Morton record. Right. They used some, but they passed on others, and so we had these kind of unplayed arrangements. And so he reached out to Kevin Clark, and Kevin Clark reached out to me, and I reached out to Craig Klein, and Craig Klein reached out. It was like that. We just kind of like, okay, what's a brass band have? I don't know, two trumpets, two trombones, and just kind of, we all went over to Craig's house because Craig was the only person who owned a house. <laughs> and, um, you know, there was a lot of just kind of, a lot of drinking beer and hanging out. We were talking about our girlfriends and just trying, and things we'd seen and bands we'd seen, and we'd play these arrangements. and. It was fun. I had something. I had, I had something I'd brought up. I'd written a song called The Imperial March. And I didn't had no idea. I didn't have a band yet. I'd just written the song. So then the next week he came back. Rick Trollson was there. The next week we came back and we played again. We're like, hey, this sounds kind of good. Let's, I have a friend, Tim Stanbaugh. I do, personally. And Tim had this really cool uh, rig where he could sit in his van and record you from inside a room. That was kind of new technology. He had these ADAT machines. That was kind of new technology. And so we went to, uh, at that time, Craig Klein and I, our main job was working for Jimmy Maxwell, who owned the, the Toulouse Cabaret, Cabaret, Cabaret on Toulouse Street, um, which is now back to being the Toulouse Cabaret. Anyway, so we j talked Jimmy into letting us come in there during the, the day and record a demo. Um, and Tom took that demo to uh, uh, Rounder Records, and Rounder Records signed us to a two-record deal. So that's how we became a band. Um, but really, for those first few years, it was just we'd get together and drink beer and talk about what was going on in our lives. Like we were really, the hang was really at least half of it. And the conversations over the years went from being our girlfriends, and we were talking about our wives, and we were talking about our, went from talking about our landlords to talking about our first houses, and then we were talking about, you know, now. <laughs> <laughs> you know what we're talking about now, and it's not girlfriends or first houses, you know what I mean? We're having those other conversations now, you know? But we've had all of them all along the way. Anyway, so the Nightcrawlers, it was nobody's main band. It's always just been a side project for everybody. And uh, we kept getting hired at the Jazz Fest and the French Quarter Fest. There were some years that's almost all we did was got together to play those festivals. And we always enjoyed it, and we would 
figure out ways to work together and to try to get things together now and then. But we all, our careers are going in different directions. Some of us became professors, some became traveling musicians. We all had different things we were doing. So to get everybody in the same room became more and more difficult. To where uh, in 1919, I, I, I realized we hadn't made a record in over 10 years. I'm sorry, what? 2019. Sorry, 2019, yeah, excuse me. <laughs> sorry. I was there in I'm aging myself, sorry. Thank you. 2019, indeed. Uh, I realized that we hadn't made a record in 10 years, and I, I knew it was partially because we couldn't figure out how to, how to get together. And so I, I said to the band, hey, look, I, let me produce a record, and uh, I've got this way we can do it. We, we set up the whole structure of how we rehearsed differently, and I made sure there was food at every rehearsal, and we made sure there was time in the middle of each rehearsal to stop playing music and go eat and talk to each other. Um, and I really think that got on the tape. Anyway, the stars aligned. The guys brought beautiful material. We were in a good spirit. I found a great studio. I got Mike Napolitano to mix it. He's my favorite guy in town. He's, in my opinion, head and shoulders above everybody else. And this was the first time I had a chance to work with him, so that was thrilling. The record comes out, and uh, literally we got the record out just as the iron door of the pandemic closed. Like, our record got pressed, um, or our CDs got pressed, but right behind us, all the CD company closed down. It was like that. And there was no, we had planned on doing a live gig, you know, to have a, a record release party. That ends up, that didn't happen. It didn't get any press because nobody knew anything about it. It was just, it just kind of disappeared, this record. But a couple of people who count heard it and liked it and nominated to be a, have a gr get a Grammy. And it got nominated and it won. Hey. Yes, 2020 I received an, a Grammy for a record that I produced with the New Orleans Nightcrawlers, a side project a band that hadn't recorded in 10 years. Um, it, that, and honestly, my whole career has been like that, good and bad, mm. in every direction. From nowhere comes, I think life is like that anyway. I think every, everybody's lives is like that to a certain extent. However, that was quite a shock to have that Grammy job in, in my pocket. I was, I was 51 or 52 at that time, you know? So um, yeah, that's how that happened. Yeah, Atmosphere, by the way, is the title of that. The, uh, the New Orleans letter. Nightcrawlers, Atmosphere is the name of the record. Yeah. yeah, and it is available, ladies and gentlemen. Any place, fine music is sold. <laughs> so pick it up, it, is a, it, is, it lives up to its Grammy-winning status. Thank you very much. Uh, another band that uh, you've been a part of for over 20 years now is the Ten Men. Well, see, actually, my favorite record that I've released in the last 30 years, 20 years, is the newest Tin Men record. Uh, it's called Hit It. I think that's the best thing I've done. Um, the band has been together for so long, we're really, we're really crystallized as a band. We went to Mike Napolitano, went to his house to do it. Uh, so it has all that goodness that Mike brings, which is hard to put into words. And um, I just felt, once again, like, you know, the. The records that sound the best, I almost always have such great memories of those records. Like Good something man. really comfortable and uh, expressive and freeing was happening in the studio as opposed to the other way. You know, in mm -hmm. the studio you had to overcome all those demons to tell you not to play. Right. You know. Um, or that mistakes are bad for music. You know, that's kind of a misclaimer. We all think when we're in the studio is that mistakes make music bad, but it actually doesn't usually. It usually makes it a little better. Don't you kind of love the mistakes? You know what I mean? The mistake tells you that the guy's there. You know what I mean? Yeah. How did you meet uh, Alex McMurray and um, Chaz? And Chaz. Uh, Alec, I met Alex McMurray playing in Davis Rogan's band, All That. Oh, yeah. Right. Which was, the f as far as I know, it was the first band in New Orleans that had sousaphone, drum set, electric guitar, keyboard, horns, and rapping. <laughs> and that's actually, that's describing a lot of bands now. That's right. actually not that rare a thing to see anymore. But as far as I can remember, Davis was the first one to 
go that to go there. And the sousaphone player was Kirk Joseph, and the guitar player was Alice McMurray. And so I wanted to become Kirk's uh, sub, and so that's how I met Alex. How you met Alex. And so, he, w I, and working with him, eventually I found out that he had a band called Royal Finger Bowl, which is his uh, original songs. And I, I had no idea that he was such a gifted writer when I started working with him, um, and was immediately a fan and was a fan for a while before I became the acoustic bass player in that band. And that band had a record label and we toured uh, for a number of years. And then uh, the label dropped us and the band broke up. And so Alex and I were not quite sure what was gonna be next for us, but I knew like 20 or 30 of his songs. Mm -hmm. And we'd had all this experience together. And uh, Chaz had just moved to town. And uh, so Alex had a, a solo gig every Wednesday night at the Circle Bar and Chaz and I would go from time to time. So one night we both brought our instruments mm -hmm. and he brought us up at the same time. And I heard it's sousaphone, washboard, acoustic guitar, and voice. That's the trio. And the first time I heard it, I said to myself, this can't lose. It's just something about the sound. It's like, who wouldn't like this? You know what I mean? And we use the fact that it does have this strange instrumentation, we use that to our advantage. We we take it as a chance to play whatever we want to play. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, it's kind of a blank slate for us in terms of what we want to create. And so it's constantly surprising and fun. That's why we've been doing it for so long. We still have more work to do. You know, we're still constantly finding songs that we talk about playing and then we burst out laughing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know we, do, we do Herbie Hancock's Rocket and it starts like this. <laughs> well, and you guys are back on Wednesdays now. And, we and are, at, yes. At DBA, the DBA. The, the club DBA has changed ownership. Tom has been great to the artists all these years and left on a high note. We will miss him. But it was taken over by uh, people who own the club's uh, Three Muses and right. the, uh, Cafe Negril and uh, Spotted Cat. So in the transference, it's a little bit more of a professional environment. Not that Tom wasn't professional. I'm just saying that it's right. a larger group handling the management of the place and so far everything's going great you know a couple of bumps but yeah. that's gonna happen so you can catch uh, 10 men most Wednesdays at DBA for the foreseeable future 6 to 8 30 yeah. free show ladies and gentlemen America's favorite four-letter word free <laughs> <laughs> free 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 <laughs> uh, well uh, feel free to play some more music what do you say guys oh, I'd love to yeah uh, I would like to uh, feature my son, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, Ben is a graduate of NOCA, which is uh, the New Orleans Academy for the Creative Arts. <laughs> and uh, is now hard at work trying to figure out his place in the music industry, which when you're his age is not an easy thing to do. Yeah, he's doing a good job. All right, here we go. Here's, here's Ben Perrine.
Duke Ellington, Juan Tizal's Caravan. Ben Perrine, drums and cymbals, ladies and gentlemen. Matt Perrine at the sousaphone. Dave Hammer, our guitar man. Another tune, ladies and gentlemen. Keep it going, keep it going, guys. Yeah, I love Irving Berlin. You know, Irving Berlin is the best, one of the best. Um, and so we're going to play a song that he wrote called I'm Putting All My Eggs in One Basket. I also love Ella Fitzgerald. Thank you. 
All right. All right, putting all my eggs in one basket. Irving Berlin, nicely done by Dave Hammer, Matt Perrine, Ben Perrine, ladies and gentlemen, entertaining you on the guitar, the sousaphone, and the drum set. Matt, we uh, mentioned earlier Nine Lives. Let's talk a little bit about that, that musical, which you were such a big part of, uh, based on Dan Baum's great book, Nine Lives, about people's experience here during yes. and after Katrina. Yes, the book is about, it, 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 it talks about the lives of nine different New Orleanians between Hurricane Betsy and Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina, Katrina, and then just a little bit afterward. And, uh, you know, he's, it, it did very well internationally, and it also really stuck a chord with a lot of people who grew up in New Orleans and felt that he got it, you know, yeah. not just uh, response to hurricanes in general, but also just kind of some of the personalities that are here and kind of how those personalities had in them what it took to rebuild the city again and again, which is what it basically comes to, is we have to just yeah. rebuild the city and renew it, you know. So, uh, yeah, Paul Sanchez is a local songwriter uh, who I'm happy to work with from time to time, and I was his bass player probably 20 years ago or so when we started this, maybe a little longer. Anyway, um, and he invited me to his house. He said, yeah, Matt, I'm, I'm thinking of writing a musical. And I'd like you to be the music director. And I almost laughed in his face, <laughs> you know, because honestly, my understanding of the world is that if you want to ruin your life, you know, mount a musical or buy a bar. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Was the two <laughs> perfect ways to take a perfectly happy life and just go totally off the rails, you know. Um, but that's, you know, but then, you know, I play, I, I spit into this large conical pipe and make fancy air for a living. So I'm not sure I'm in the position to be calling anybody else crazy at all. You know, we're all, we're all a little bit nuts in the entertainment industry, you know. Anyway, so, you know, Paul and I, we're beginning to talk this thing up, and then Pepsi comes out with this grant uh, that if we, you know, basically it's, it's you know, some, you know, I think it was twenty or $30,000 uh, to make a project kind of like ours, and Paul had some friends in a group called the Threadheads, and so he kind of got them all worked up, and they, it was, and you got the grant through votes, and so we actually got the grant, which was wonderful. Now we have the money that we can make uh, Paul's like, oh, okay, let's use this money. We're going to make a, um, a cast album of the musical. What we didn't realize was in the fine print of the grant was that we had to start in like two weeks and it had to be finished in like six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the fine print, ladies and gentlemen. And so it went from, you know, talking about what these songs might be like to like every day I'm getting multi Paul and Coleman just got to work writing and I got to work arranging. And luckily we kind of know each other and we all had similar ideas about where the material should go because it just came together really, really fast. Um, and we were able to get Michael Cerverus to sing it with us. Michael Cerverus has two Tonys um, and he was just starring in Gilded Age, that television show. Um, and before that, I mean, he's a Broadway. He did he did Evita, and he did he's done everything. Look up Michael Servers if you don't know who he is. Uh, anyway, he'll be back. We're doing this thing in a couple of weeks. He'll be back. Also, Brian Bat, local uh, actor, will be here, playing a, playing playing roles like you've never seen him play before. I guarantee. Um, Alex McMurray will be a part, and Paul Sanchez, and so that'll be at uh, the what's the name of that. Uh, the Civic, the Civic Theater, okay. on the Monday of uh, the Monday between the two Jazz Fest weekends. So, come see. It'll, and we're, 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 what we're doing is we're doing a staged presentation of the song. So it's going to be more like a concert than a musical. We're just going to be on the so on the stage together, a little bit of plot, and then the singing of the songs. And just the songs is going to take, you know, uh, two hours or so, hour and a half. So, anyway. That's what my brain is right now. All, all my free time between now and then is going to be trying yeah. to keep that thing moving in the right direction. Yeah, that um, 
I agree with uh, that assessment of Dan's piece that inspired it all, uh, really was some of the best writing about the people here and how, how New Orleanians felt about everything that had happened. And uh, so the musical uh, is a great expression of that and it's wonderful that it's coming back here. I agree, I agree. I'm always, I'm always happy to work with Paul. And I've been a music theater fanatic for, since I was a kid. And this is my first chance to really be involved in something on the ground floor. And Paul and Coleman, really, I can't thank them enough yeah. for having the opportunity to do, to do this writing. I mean, it's a life's ambition for me to be able to do a show like this. When you're talking about the, uh, the challenges of, of doing a musical, remind me of that old joke of, you know, the quickest way to make a jazz musician a millionaire? <laughs> Give him $5 million to yes. open a jazz club. <laughs> so true. <laughs> or play their instrument. There's lots of good yeah. ways to lose the money. Yeah. Um, well, uh, uh, another thing that you've uh, done, really, I think, from from even back in California before you came here, you've been involved with teaching, uh, involved with teaching in, in a lot of different ways. But uh, uh, talk a little bit about what that has meant to you, the I teaching part of your life. I really do love to teach. Uh, my mom was a, a school, a, a teacher, a grade school teacher. And um, she would have me come into her classroom um, to help set up sometimes. Or also, when I was young, she'd have me come with my instruments and just explain, to give, a, give a, a talk to the kids. When I was like you know, 12 and 13, she'd have wow. me come in and do that. And she always had lots of children's books around the house because she wanted to make sure that her kids were getting the good ones. You know, there's good ones and there's bad ones. And so she would have, she'd ha we'd read them together. We'd talk about what's a good book for children and why mm -hmm. they're good. And so, you know, she had me thinking about education theory from a young age. Um, and I found when I went into the workforce that playing, writing, and teaching, somehow when I'm doing all three, everything yeah. fires better. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? There's some kind of connective tissue between right. them. Um, that they all do better with each other. And so, I, yeah, I've done some teaching in some camps and I've had some private lessons and then I taught for about 10 years at the University of New Orleans, uh, teaching a traditional jazz combo, which I loved very much. Um, and presently I teach, uh, Banu Gibson does a, a camp, an adult traditional jazz camp, it happens every year in New Orleans in June at the Bourbon Orleans. It's, it was one week, but it got too popular. So now it's two weeks. And these people, these people come from all over the world. And some of them come because they really want a deep musical experience. And some come because they like hanging out with other people and doing things in New Orleans. And the music's yeah. just a part of it, you know. Right. So I like to do that. Um, but I really am hoping um, that moving into my future that I can find chances to do more um, being a teaching artist. Mm -hmm doing that type of work, being able to come in and helping people. If, if they have a program that's already going, what, how can my experience come in and plug into that and you know, be something that enforces or, or uh, not, but, but helps that program? You know? So I'm looking for opportunities to do that as much as I can. Good. I, I know you're very, very good at that and that it's been helpful to you as a, as a professional to have the experience of uh, all those students. A hundred percent. Yeah, teaching, anybody who, who isn't learning while they're teaching is not really doing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're doing it wrong, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I want to talk about just a, a couple of other uh, ensembles you've been, been part of. One of them that I, I, uh, I don't know if they're still gigging at all, but I really enjoyed John Ellis and Double Wide when that, that band was happening. Yeah, John, John Ellis is a saxophone player uh, from North Carolina who moved to New Orleans. And uh, he and I were friends and we did a couple of things together, but we never really got a chance to work together. And then he moved back to New York and he carried with him this desire to really open up the sousaphone and see what the sousaphone could do, kind of like we're doing here, that sometimes it's a bass instrument and sometimes it's a lead instrument. But that's not so easy to do because in music most of the time there is almost always a bass instrument. And so when I, you probably noticed when I went to melody, there was something kind of missing underneath. You know, you're used to that bass line happening. So he put together a band with the sousaphone and the keyboard player would play a ba B3 organ, which has the foot pedals and all that, so that 
sometimes he's the bass player and I'm part of the horn section, or sometimes I'm the bass player and he's part of the rhythm section. So that's why the band's called Double Wide. And uh, John is an amazing composer who, one of the things that's amazing to me about John is that um, when he writes a song, he's not worried, it doesn't seem to me like he's worried about what kind of a song it is. You know, I find that I'm, I, I lack a little bit of confidence in that when I write a song, I'll then look at the song and say, okay, well that's a jazz song. And so being a jazz song, I'm gonna change this here and I'm gonna move this, and, you know. And the song gets kind of moved toward whatever genre defines it easiest. And John doesn't do that. And when he gives you the song, he doesn't tell you what it is. You just you play, start playing the song and you figure it out together. And uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful experience to be in. And also something about, else about John Ellis I want to mention is that most people, when they start getting any kind of academic or any kind of intellectual process involved in their music, especially jazz, sense of humor goes out the window. <laughs> and that does not happen. Well, first of all, that tends not to happen in bands with sousaphones. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. A sousaphone, player, a sousaphone player without a sense of humor is a sad state of affairs, <laughs> truly. Um, so, yeah, and so once again, it's a band that we'll, we'll know we're on the right track if we all find that we've been laughing for the last half hour, like, okay, or the last 30 seconds, like, okay, well, that idea stays. Yeah. That, um, I haven't uh, checked lately. Does, does Double Wide still exist? Oh, all my projects exist. They, just, they all just, you know, they're all just like, I know, know it'd be hard for you guys to get together. We're incubating. <laughs> oh right, right. They aren't extinct. <laughs> that, that band is on is on uh, injured reserve. <laughs> no, it's like you know, it's 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 never been easy to record bands or to go take bands on the road. It's just never been easy, and it's a constantly changing terrain. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think John, you know, for the for the time being, is doing things that are paying rent, and he's yeah, happy right. doing. You know, yeah. Um, that being said, we have a new record in the can of all ready to go. Jason Marsalis, myself, John Ellis, and uh, um, Fer 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 on trombone, um, Alan Fair on trombone, yeah. and um, uh, um, anyway, great, great musicians, ready to go. We just need to have a <laughs> if somebody books one gig, all of a sudden John's going to spend ten thousand dollars finishing that record. So we can <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, somebody got to book that thing, get that record out. Oh, yeah. man, that'd be great. And I um, wanted to talk just a, just a minute about another innovative group you've been a part of, Bonorama. Yeah. Yeah, that's another kind of, uh, all these things, there's something that I, I, I try to talk to Ben about. Like, you, when you're in your 20s, in your early 30s, you do things, and they're just things. They're just another thing that you're doing. And there's all these crazy things you do, and most of it feels like it's just not going to be anything. It's just another thing that you do. And it's not till years later you go, you go, oh, I've been playing. This is now my main thing. This is the band right. that I do now. It always just starts as, or generally, starts as just kind of a one-off or somebody's idea. Mark Mullins was approached. This is when Tipitina's had a downtown location. All right. He was approached about putting together a series of concerts, uh, and he wanted to feature the trombone. And uh, he had written these trombone charts for a band called Guitarama. All right. And so that's when he called that group Bonarama, so it could be Bonarama playing with Guitarama. That's really where it came from. <laughs> um, and we played a show. Uh, and it was fun. It was it's it's four trombones. At that time, it was more. It was like eight trombones, tuba going through an amplifier with uh, pedals and stuff, electric guitar and drums playing New Orleans funk and rock and roll. That's that's what Bone Rabbit was doing then. That's mainly what we do. And we played a show, and the next show we did, people had came back from the first show and asked for songs. Right away, just like that, there are a handful of people who are already coming back and asking for stuff. And usually that doesn't happen so quick. Right. And Bonorama just took off. And so that's been one of my main projects. Yeah, yeah. it's a lot of fun uh, for, as an old trombonist myself to hear that, that uh, multi-trombone sound. I love that way that 
it's well, another it's another band where I feel like when I write for that band, I have the benefit of people don't really know what it's going to sound like. Like I'm I'm not writing; it doesn't sound like Kai Wending or something. You know what <laughs> right, I mean? It's, right. it, it definitely has a different sound to it, and um, yeah, I've I've really loved writing for that band. Yeah. Well, let's hear some more music. Uh, what oh, you right. say, guys? Yeah. So. I do love doing all types of music, and one of our favorite artists is Jimi Hendrix. Uh, so we're gonna play some Jimi Hendrix for you now. Past. With this 
crush its old age and its wisdom It whispers, no, this will be the last and The wind, it screams, Mary Jimi Hendrix is done by the Matt Perrine Trio, featuring Mr. Dave Hammer on the guitar and vocals, ladies and gentlemen. Ben Perrine at the drums, Matt at the sousaphone. Thanks, but you know, Jimmy did most of the work. <laughs> <laughs> Writing the song, it was all just right there. We really had just had to play it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I, yeah, it just took me right back to uh, 1969 hearing Jimi Hendrix for the first time. Who was his tuba player? <laughs> Lefty was his name. <laughs> I think he just went by Lefty. <laughs> and he smoked Lefties as well. Um, it's hard to play the sousaphone with the left hand, I'll tell you that. It's a specialized skill. Yeah, yeah they, you can't turn it around like a guitar, like no. a left-handed guitar. So. <laughs> uh, I want to uh, just mention one other band that you uh, played with, had a nice long relationship with, and continue to work with at the Spotted Cat. That's the Panorama the Jazz Panorama Band. The Panorama Jazz Band. Holy cow. That's another, you know, I, I got to say, it's... Once again, it's a band that now is a, it's, it's an institution in town. It's one of the top uh, klezmer bands in town. Uh, also, we've been playing practically every Saturday night at the Spy Cat since that club's creation, it seems. Mm -hmm. you know. And it started with Ben had got out of college, and he kind of had this idea for an acoustic party band, and he started putting together musicians. And I remember when he first started, he wasn't really good enough. Mm -hmm. And his leadership wasn't good enough, and the book was really hard. It was like all this klezmer music and all this, um, also all this kind of uh, this um, Baltic music that he wanted to do. It's all really strange, and these little charts, and his musicians weren't good enough, and the job would pay thirty dollars. It was just frustrating in every way. <laughs> and then twenty years later, I. I and I knew Ben, I saw the band improving and such, and 20 years later I saw him at the Spotted Cat, and wow, now it has Aurora, Aurora Nealon, and mm -hmm. Charlie Halloran, right. and Doug Garrison, and John Groh, who's playing tuba in the band. Yeah. And that band was slamming all the way, you know? And it's just, he just kept doing it, just kept doing that crazy thing that didn't make any sense, and nobody else around him was doing it. He just kept doing it. And it succeeded. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure to watch Ben Shank grow with that band and that band grow um, yeah. over the years. And now, like you say, man, they can knock it out. Yeah. Although I will say that I, I, I talk about him as being a, beater, a leader as if he didn't have all the skills he's supposed to have. I will say that he was raised a Quaker. And I think that he learned the most important skills of being a band leader with that upbringing. And in that ter way, he's way better now than most band leaders I know. <laughs> he carries that stillness with him into his band leading, which I think uh, helps a lot. And so you work with those guys um, every other Saturday? Every other Saturday at the Spired Cat, and, um, and we, like I said, we're, we're, we're New Orleans' number one klezmer band. You know, so there's lots of opportunities to go play klezmer music. Oh yeah, and that's, that's great stuff. Man. Sure is. Well, uh, I think we have time for you guys to knock out one more for us. So one more. Yeah. Folks, has this been okay for you? <laughs> Is there anything that you didn't know that you want to know? Is there anything that I have, we haven't answered? Uh, we're going to leave you with one more song, I guess. Is that appropriate? Yeah. Okay. Um, and we just want you to know that we... I really appreciate you being here. Having an audience here made this a lot more fun for me and a lot more comfortable. And I appreciate you spending part of your afternoon, if not your vacation, here with us. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your time here in New Orleans. Amen.
New Orleans. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ben Perrine at the drums and cymbals. <laughs> this is Dave Hammer at the guitar with the vocals. Our special guest on Suzapone, Mr. Matt Perrine. Ladies and gentlemen, the Matt Perrine Trio. Check out Matt and the Ten Men DBA Wednesdays and uh, every other Saturday with the Panorama Jazz Band at the Spotted Cat. And don't forget, Nine Lives, the musical at the Civic on Monday, April 29th. And uh, 
you will have three chances uh, to hear this great artist uh, within a variety of settings. He's always doing something interesting, always something uh, of, um, surprising. And we really appreciate these three guys being here for us today. And you being here as well. And I hope you'll join us on Thursday, May 9th, when our guests will be for the next uh, Talking Jazz in Concert, Donald Harrison, Jr., wonderful saxophonist and composer and cultural activist in New Orleans. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs>